Back a long ways. He's also one of my be very best friends in life, Ken Snyder. <clears throat> I didn't know him in high school. He went to Col Columbus Catholic. I went to East Waterloo. I was always hoping Alvin Wright, my teammate, would beat Snyder, but never happened. <clears throat> One thing about Ken, he was coachable because when he got to you and we got to you and I together. We had come from different cultures. At East Waterloo, out of 12 guys, it was me and another guy with only white guys on the team at that time. It was great. I mean, I, I'm not complaining. It was great. But when I uh, met Ken, like he came right all I had was Motown. That's all I just had Motown stuff, and he did. He, yeah. <laughs> And he actually said, what's Motown? <laughs> but he was coachable because before I took him over to meet some of my buddies from high school, I said, because Ken's one of these guys that would say, hello, I'm Ken Snyder, nice to meet you. And uh, I said, Ken, you can't do that, man. You know, just say, hey, what's going on? How you doing, man? That's, that's all you got to say. And so... That was our start, and uh, but here, here's what happened. You know, we weren't great then. You and I were a Division two school back then. Obviously, if you did well enough, you could go to Division one. And uh, when we met, we kind of had a bond that we were not going to take a back seat to any of the guys on in our on our team that were upperclassmen. And you know, we were good teammates, but we really wanted to win and we raised each other up I needed him we raised each other up and uh, the good part was others came with us and uh, our sophomore year Chuck Patton was the coach of you and I at the time uh, he, he he made us cap the only two captains of the team as sophomores and that was kind of weird at first but uh, we ran with it and uh, and as we went, raising each other's level, because he, he, you know, this guy's the toughest guy I competed with day in and day out in my career. And, uh, you know, it raised us up, but also raised up the level of other people in that room. And, you know, at one point we just wanted to make the team, then you want to make the Nationals, then you want to win D2, and then you want to win D1, and the whole, it just kept, you know, the ceiling just kept getting broken down. And, uh, all success I had was a big part to do with him. And uh, Kenny won, uh, he was second, first, first in Division Two, and, and uh, two-time All-American in Division One. And, and uh, uh, this guy uh, had a big impact on, on myself and, and a whole bunch of other people in that program. So <clears throat> let's bring him up, Ken Snyder. Appreciate that, Mill boy. Mill also is a good student. He tuned me into Motown, and by the time we were seniors, I went to his room one time, he was listening to the Carpenters. <laughs> you remember them? So, most of you people are too young to even know who the Carpenters are. They are not Motown, let me tell you that. And that is a joke. Anyway, I want to thank the, or, uh, the committee for uh, this great honor. I want to thank you today for the um, introduction. Isn't a wrestling crowd great? There's nothing like a wrestling crowd. I've been in business 35 years and I ran a Merrill Lynch office and have been around the most successful people in the country when it comes to finance and the world. And I'll tell you what, give me a wrestling crowd any day of the week. I'm telling you, there's just something about it. When you talk to somebody and you know that they're a wrestler, you know what they've been through. Okay? And Outside the wrestling arena, people don't get that. And Iowa is probably one of the greatest states ever for the sport of wrestling. I was lucky enough to grow up in Waterloo, Iowa. Okay, When I was growing up there, Waterloo was the greatest hotbed of wrestling, high school wrestling. Okay, I'll tell you, give you an idea how great it was. In 1964, which is the year I started wrestling in junior high, I was in sixth grade, Dan Gable won his first state championship. 
West High had three state champions and two runners up. And guess what? Their team did not win the state championship. Okay? Guess who won it? Another team from Waterloo. East Waterloo. Mill Boys alma mater. They took five guys to state. They had five state champions. How about that? That's how good Waterloo was. In fact, from uh, Mike Chapman's book, one of his books I started looking at just for the heck of it, um, from 1949 to 1973, that's 24 years, West, East, or Cedar Falls was either first or second every one of those years. That's pretty good. When I started wrestling in 1964 to 1971, that's eight years, West High were state champions five of those eight years. That's pretty good. When I started wrestling, not that I'm old, but I started on a horsehair mat. Anybody ever know what one of those were? Horsehair mat, I'll tell you what, you, you, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about if when you go home, take your brother or whatever, your spouse, whatever, put her inside wrist ride, and then rub her face across that carpet for about six feet and see what kind of burn she has on her face or he has on his face. Now, it's not that I'm old. It's just that I went to the Catholic school. We didn't have a lot of money. But we did have a guy by the name of Bob Bozen. And Bob Bozen was my junior high wrestling coach. And he coached a lot of people that were state champions, state place winners, national champions at all different levels, and Division I national champions, okay? And by the time I was in eighth grade, he bought a regular mat, okay? And, but in my junior high, when I started, we had, you know, the key to success in anything is surround yourself with good people. Okay, we had one of the best Merrill Lynch's offices in the whole country for the size of the town that I'm in. Because I'm in a town of only 15,000 people. And we were competing with New York and everybody else. Okay, and the reason we were successful is because the same principles that I learned in wrestling. But at an early age, I had good people. Okay, I had Steve Yagla, who was Chuck's older brother, who was a year older than me, started wrestling a little bit before me, and beat the crap out of me every single night. Okay, and... <clears throat> Jim Herring, who also was a year older than me and wrestled, was really good. And then tonight, Yags brings a scrapbook and shows that Bob Bowlesby beat him when West wrestled Columbus junior year. How about that? Nobody here is surprised. <laughs> <laughs> like a true Bob Bowlesby. I love it. That is awesome. So anyway, I'm getting beat up by these guys for, you know, sixth grade. Finally, eighth grade. Yeg was gone. Steve's gone. Chuck's just kind of getting started. But I'm thinking, man, the only guy that's around is Dickie Ramsey. He was like this much shorter than me, a little pudgy guy. He was a basketball player. He's one of the only eighth graders. So I'm thinking, I got it made. I'm going to get the crap out of this guy like I've been getting it for two years. So I'm sitting there listening to Bob Bowles and give us the word what's going to happen and all this stuff. And I'm licking my chops. I'm thinking, Ramsey's in trouble the whole year. And all of a sudden, down the steps into the gym, waltzes. Steve Yagla, again, with his gym bag. And he'd wrestled varsity for Columbus as a ninth grader and did very, very well. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, who signed me up for this? And sure enough, Bozen talked him into coming down every single night and kicked the crap out of me in my whole eighth grade year. So the moral of the story is get good people around you and they'll make you look good at some point in time. Okay? So then as we move into from Sacred Heart, we get into Columbus. You know, Columbus never had anybody that coached wrestling when I was there, or when Chuck was there, I don't think, that I had ever wrestled. I mean, we had a guy that was six foot five, weighed about 100, 275 pounds, and you know, we were wrestling goals one time. I mean, Chuck Yagle and I kicked the crap out of each other every night, and he'd lay in the mat. And, you know, those wrestling rooms were warm. We kept it about 105 degrees. And one time he was laying on his arm, and he was hitting the, blowing the whistle and hitting the timer for our goals. And the next thing you know, the go kept on going and going and going. And Chuck and I are still wailing on each other. We look over, this guy's sound asleep. <laughs> so when we fight, beat a guy from West High, we relished that, okay? And the, uh, so you got to have good people. I had great people with Chuck Yagler, which you're well aware of his history. Um, and also, in, you know, Waterloo, back then, wrestling was king. And it didn't matter who you were. I mean, I was from Columbus, but we used to work out at West High. Bob Siddons and Don Huff, they used to allow us to come over there and we'd work out. In fact, one night in a workout, I worked out with Dave Moses, who was a two-time state champion. I was a sophomore that year. Rod Hart, who ended up being a two-time state champion. 
and Bill Andrew, who was a state champion. So one night in a workout, I wrestled against guys that had won five state champions, okay, state championships. And I thought, wow, that is really what you need to do, okay? Um, since then, uh, another wrestler had a big impact on my life, a kid from high school, who introduced me to my wife, Shelly. Now, if people think I'm a salesman, look at her and look at me. <laughs> Need I say more? No. Okay. So we had five daughters and five great son-in-laws. I've got three daughters with me, one with, back there with my youngest granddaughter. And I've got eight grandchildren, my middle daughter and my youngest daughter and two of the husbands. And they're awesome. Okay. My daughters are smart. They're not only beautiful, but they're beautiful inside. And they're smart. They picked athletes. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, you know that t-shirt? Somebody coined it that was Dan Gable that did the t-shirt that on the back of wrestlers, you know, shirt that says, once you've wrestled, everything else is easy. I made up a new one. Once you've raised five daughters, everything else is easy. Okay? That thing's going on sale next week. But when I got to you and I, Chuck Patton recruited me and I had, you know, if you're a state champion back then at, at Iowa, you'd go anywhere. You know, I had five different full ride scholarships from different schools. I was really almost committed to Oklahoma. And then I ended up on at UNI just because I loved Chuck Patton. The guy was just a first class guy. And he sold me on the idea that you can have the best of both worlds. You can win a Division II national championship. You can also qualify for the Division I's and win that as well. And it was close to my hometown, so I thought it's good enough for me. And Chuck Patton created a whole different atmosphere. You know, at you and I, there was an open door policy. I know Dan Gable came up there and worked out. I know Rich Bendick worked out. There was uh, uh, Dave Moses, there were Armin Doug Moses. There was Chuck Jean. All kinds of wrestlers came in and came through our wrestling room. And here's the key. Patton would let you in. Your ticket was 10 minutes of demonstrating what you do best. And that's why you and I raised to a level where we were competing with Division I National Championship teams. Okay? Division II was a lot different back then. In fact, the, my freshman year, I had mononucleosis. I was not redshirted. We didn't do that back then. You and I didn't have enough money. So I lost the year of competition. But out of the Division II, there was two Division I national champions. Okay, the, if you got through the, if you won the top three places in Division II, you qualified for Division I. Sophomore year, Don Roan beat Millboy for third place. The next week, wrestled in the Division I tournament and won the whole thing. Okay. In fact, um, that year, no, the, yeah, that, that year, uh, the Division II had the outstanding wrestler, okay, of the Division I tournament. Um, and that year, they also had three Division I national championships. My junior year, uh, Division II, there was two Division II champions that won Division I. The Division II wrestler won the outstanding wrestler award and the pinning award, okay? <coughs> I was third that year, Millboy was second, and um, so it was awesome, it really was. Uh, Chuck Patton built a dream, and his dream was to recruit good, good kids, and the thing about Chuck is, there was no excuses. No matter what you had to do, if, if you had to meet, no matter who we were wrestling, if it was Iowa, Iowa State, whoever, tomorrow night, 7.30, the whistle's going to blow, and you got to be ready. You make weight. You do whatever you need to do to win, okay? And there was no excuses whatsoever. In fact, you'd be telling them one reason why you didn't do this or, or whatever, you know? And he would just say, yeah, that's as good as any other excuse and just turn around and walk away. So we learned real early, don't give him any excuses. I had a great schedule. I looked at my last two years just for the heck of it, uh, pulled out some old scrapbooks, and the last two years I had over 44 matches and over half of them both years were against Division I opponents. So he provided an atmosphere where we had great competition. Um, he also was smart. He surrounded us around good people. Don Briggs, who was a Hawkeye, came to UNI, was an assistant coach. My sophomore year, I was runner-up in Division II, qualified for the Division I's out in Seattle. And Don Briggs, I don't know if he sold his car or what he did, but we didn't have money, but somehow he got out to Seattle to work out with me to get me ready for the division once, okay? That guy was committed. Mike McCready, I don't know if anybody in here remembers Mac. He was a uh, 
two-time Division II national champion. His senior year, he was third in Division I. The only guy that beat him was Chris Taylor. Beat him two times his senior year. If you remember Chris Taylor, he was what, 6'5"? Did he weigh 480 pounds? 450, something like that? Mac in the Midlands got behind him twice. Could not get his arm around his stomach to take him down. I mean, it was, and that's the only guy that beat him. But the thing that Mac did is he brought back, um, he was with Athletes in Action. And as a result, he was a Pan American champion as well. And as a result of what Mac brought back, he, he started talking to us about what Athletes in Action was all about. And the next thing you know, we arrested Athletes in Action. Athletes in Action back then prophesied, them. They, they basically shared the gospel during the wrestling meets. And everybody thought, what are these guys doing, you know? They show up at the meet, and they had some pretty good wrestlers. Gene Davis, who wrestled with Dan in the Olympic team, and was a silver medalist, I believe. And they had some other guys that were Olympians, and these guys were good. And everybody made fun of those guys. They say they're the Bible beaters and all this stuff, and they called them the God Squad. But when they took off their warm-ups, they had T-shirts and a picture of Jesus on the front, and in the back in big letters said God Squad. And they talked about what they did, and then they... You know, we had a wrestling match and it was awesome. But as a result of that, I became a believer. And what I liked about that, because, you know, there's a wrestling is a mental and a physical thing. But Dan said it best, the mental is the key, okay? And what I found for me was the spiritual element of the competition and how important it was for me to block everything out and to turn my performance over to Jesus. And I'll tell you what, by the time we got done, I think eight of our ten guys on our team were believers by the time we were seniors. Jim Miller was my teammate, wrestled with him every single night. Millboy was crazy. If you think he was intense as a coach at Wartburg, you should have wrestled with him every night. I mean, there was no friends in the wrestling room. I remember one night, I can't remember if I hit him with an elbow or what, but it knocked his tooth out, and it was just kind of hanging there. And I thought, good, I don't have him to wrestle with the rest of the night. He goes, I don't know where he went. Somewhere, somebody found a dentist and they took, they sawed it down his tooth, and I don't know if you've ever seen where you just got a little spike hanging there. So his tooth is gone, you just got this little spike that eventually they're gonna put the cap on to. And before the workout was over, here's Millboy, back to wrestle. He had to make weight. And all he had was a little spike there. I mean, it was unbelievable. But that's the way Mill rolled. He was from Elu, keep that, keep that in mind. The best thing about Millboy is that he missed the Iowa meet. The Iowa meet was the year when I was a junior, and they were ranked one or two, I think, in Division One, and we were one or two in Division Two. We wrestled them at, at the uh, old gym, West Gym. Best dual meet that's ever taken place there. I'm not kidding you. When we came down there and rolled onto the mat to wrestle the Hawkeyes, you know, we had the benches at the end of the mat where we'd throw our headgears down, we'd go out, warm up, shake hands, come back, sit on the bench, right? There were so many people in there that they had taken the benches away and students were sitting on the floor. We had to sit on a little corner of the bleacher and warm up out in the hallway underneath the stands, okay? And that was the last time that we had ever beaten, you and I beat Iowa. We beat them 17 to 15. I used to be kind of embarrassed at how long that took. And then I realized that Ohio State hadn't beat the Hawkeyes either in probably just as long. And there's a lot of other teams that hadn't beaten the Hawkeyes in just that amount of time, okay? So I didn't feel embarrassed anymore. But I remember our senior year, he had already taken runner-up, I was third, and we ran in OR Latham in the morning, 6.30 running workout, we ran three mornings a week, and I remember we were sitting there, you know, sweating after our running workout, and Mill says, Sned, you know we got to win this thing. We're, we, had, we had already won the Division Two, okay, and we are headed to Division One. Back then, we only had, finals were on Saturday night, we only had four days, and we were already wrestling the Division One tournament. We didn't have two weeks to rest up, okay? So it was not an easy qualifier. So we were sitting there, shaking off our sweat and trying to keep it going and stuff. He says, you know, we gotta win this thing. We've got nothing else to do. You've already taken third, I've already taken second. We gotta win this thing. So we were geared. So all of a sudden, the quarterfinal round, Mill breaks his ankle and they're taping him up. He can't hurt, he, I mean, he can't stand up. He was on crutches the rest of the thing. Still ended up fourth. Still end up fourth in the tourney. The finals of the Division Two, I cracked two ribs and pulled the cartilage off another one. And still, at the semifinals, I still thought I got a, I mean, I was all taped up, had a shot at cortisone, the whole nine yards. 
And we were sitting there, and I was wrestling up Ray Allen. I had a heck of a time beating that guy. He was from Northwestern, very quick, but thought I can get him this time. It was the semifinals. We'd already wrestled like five times, and he beat me twice. I beat him twice. But anyway, right at the end, okay, I've got him. It's the semifinals. I've got him in a single. He's ahead of me by one. I pick him up, sweep his foot up, take him down. I'm looking at the clock, and I still have two seconds left. The referee yells two. There's one second left. Boom, whistle. I'm in the finals, okay? Then all of a sudden, the score table, or the referee goes over the score table, comes back, sits on the time ran up, <coughs> raised Andre Allen's hand. He's in the finals, not me. And I thought, wow, this is unbelievable. I just got screwed, okay? Chuck Patton would say, should have taken him down two seconds earlier. <laughs> Good point, okay? But spiritually, I'm like, what the heck, you know? So, but before that match, I remember seeing a t-shirt that Andre Allen was wearing. Guess what it had? Picture of Jesus on the front. I thought, oh my gosh, I got another Christian I got to wrestle. How's this going to work? But, you know, I kind of had a struggle with that until I saw Andre Allen at the Nationals back then, Worldwide of Sports, with broadcast the final matches and they interview the wrestlers before the match and they talked to Andre Allen and he talked to them about his faith and all of a sudden it dawned on me I don't think I would have been mature enough to talk about my faith on national TV and maybe that's why he won but it doesn't matter because what you learn in the sport of wrestling is that even when you get beat you still got to get up and you still got to move on when you lose a business deal you still got to get up the next day you got to move on you can't let a loss drag you down forever. You got to keep moving on. And I appreciate you guys put in this Hall of Fame. I'm honored to be on this with these guys here. And um, this is phenomenal. Thank you very much.